All right, hello, youth scientists, and welcome back. My name is Dana, and I'm a member of the education team here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, coming to you live from Long Beach today. Now, today we're going to be exploring together and learning a little bit about whales and conservation. Now, conservation means how we're keeping these animals around for generations to come. So we're going to explore a little bit about whales in general and what we know about them, and then we're going to talk about um, how we might be protecting them and how we're learning more and more as we go. So if that sounds like something you youth scientists are excited about, then go ahead and join me. Hopefully you were here yesterday and learned a little bit about um, what was your class yesterday? Let's find out. Yesterday you were learning about coral reefs and conservation. Tomorrow is sharks and conservation. So you'll see we have a theme going on here. Um, and then after the program, we actually do have some activities for you to participate in. If you're interested, you can find that link on our page, and I'll explain a little bit more about that at the end. But during the program, if you want to participate and ask questions or share observations or anything like that, we do have a phone number, excuse me, right here, and that phone number is 562 286-1838. Now I have Sarah in the studio who's going to be controlling what's going on behind me. She's doing a little dance back there. I have Cynthia out in our office who's going to be fielding your questions and passing them in towards me. Um, and, and I will try to answer as many of them as we can on air. All about participation and making sure that we're talking about what you are interested in. Now if you're not watching this live, which means you're watching it outside of the hours of 1 to 1.30, in the afternoon on Tuesday, the 28th of July. Wow, it's almost August. Um, if you're not watching it during that half hour window, we do encourage you to use our live, or our, sorry, not live email address. Now that's live, L-B-A-O-P dot org. I know that's a little confusing, but live at L-B-A-O-P dot org when you are watching this after our live stream. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to talk about is whales, just whales in general. What do we know about them, right? What makes a whale a whale? So Sarah's going to put some animals up on the screen, and we'll just kind of talk about what these characteristics might be. Um, so the first one, any whale you want. She's like, ooh, any whale. <laughs> ah, beautiful. So this is actually one of my favorite whales. This is a humpback whale. And what makes a whale a whale? Like, how do you know you're looking at a whale and not an ostrich? Hopefully you know the difference, right? Uh, a whale and not a penguin, right? So first things, they live in the water, right? Um, you can see this one is actually underwater right here. They have a tail. We like to call it a fluke. Oftentimes they'll have a dorsal fin on top. Of course, they have their head over here. They typically have large mouths, little tiny eyes. They have their blowholes, right? But whales are in a group of animals known as mammals, and you and I are in that group as well. So let's chat a little bit about what makes a mammal a mammal and try to understand the shared characteristics that this humpback and I and you have in common. So let's just take a look at it for a moment. Hmm. Well, I don't have a tail. I don't have a dorsal fin. But what do we share? So it's actually an acronym that can remind us what all mammals share. And the acronym is whale, right? So let's start by spelling that out. So W-H-A-L-E. Well, W, warm-blooded. All of our mammals are warm-blooded animals. Now that means that um, we're trying really hard to maintain a core temperature. So if we were to go stand in the middle of the desert, we, as humans, we're going to start sweating, right? We're going to get pretty hot. We're going to try to release heat through our body. And that's because our body is warming up and we want to get back to our main core temperature. Now, if we were to go stand out in the snow, we're going to start shivering, right? Our body temperature starts to drop and our body's like, wait, I don't like that. So we start to shiver to get a little bit warmer. We're working to maintain typically a 98.6 degree temperature. Now, when you have a fever, that means something's wrong right? That's not good. So that's your body kind of freaking out and trying to figure out how to get back to that 98.6. Um, so warm-blooded, they, they don't hang out at 98.6, but they keep that nice core temperature by covering their body with blubber, which is a nice thick fatty layer to keep them warm in the cold water. Another shared character characteristic, so WH. Hmm. I wonder what H might be. Oh, hair right? Now you might be looking at me like, wait a second, hairy whales and dolphins? What are you talking about? But believe it or not, if you were to look up close to this nose or rostrum area right here, 
we looks like we're getting a picture. Perfect. So these little bumps, uh, there's a lot of hair follicles right up in here, especially on the young ones, on young whales, young dolphins. They have little whiskers right around their nose or their rostrum. And that we're going to rediscuss in just a moment because it actually connects to another characteristic. But it's true. Dolphins and whales can be hairy. Okay. Now, maybe not as hairy as humans, right? Because we have hair on our head. And if you look close, we have hair all over our bodies. But um, they typically just have it concentrated right up in here. Ah, someone's gotten the connection there. So I'll, I'll, I'll give a shout out to that here in a moment. Let's go through the acronym again. So W-H-A. Hmm. <sighs> Air breathing. So all our mammals have lungs which we breathe with, uh, we breathe air, right? So we're pulling our oxygen from the air around us. Now that might be confusing in an ocean living animal. That's one of the main characteristics when you're looking at just like size and lifestyle between sharks and whales, right? For example, a whale shark, they are in fact sharks. They don't have lungs, they don't have hair. So they have, their, uh, they have gills that makes them a fish or a shark. We call them whale sharks because they are the size of a whale, right? But our whales, they are air breathers. That's actually what their blowholes are for, okay? Um, let's see. W-H-A. Um, there we are. Good. Okay. L. So L. Somebody actually pointed this out. They sent in the observation um, that it's live birth. Now, that's where we're going to connect the little hairs on their noses for. Um, oh, no, sorry, that's next. Uh, so live birth, you're right. So I want you to think about that for a second, right? Where are humans typically born? In a hospital, in a bed, right? In cars, there's a lot of crazy car birth stories, right? But for the most part, uh, we are being, we're air breathers being born into an air environment, right? Um, now, our whales, they are air breathers being born underwater, Okay, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. There's a lot of challenges as a mom whale of how you're going to take care of that little baby calf. And so whales are actually born tail first. That way, when the head is born, mom can just boop, push it up to the surface of the water so that it gets its first breath. So live birth, exactly. And then here we go. Here's the connection. Those little hairs on their nose help to tickle mom and cause her body to produce milk. So the E is that they eat milk, all right? So um, they are they, they feed their babies milk and babies nurse on milk from mom. So there's those main characteristics, right? That's actually what we share and have in common with our whales, even though, like I said, I don't look anything like that. I don't think, right? Maybe it's like this, right? So whales and humans. Drastically different in appearance, but they do share those characteristics. Now, let's talk a little bit about the whales that we might have here in California, because that's where the, the bulk of our conservation um, comes into play. So we're going to bring up a couple slides here that talk about the different species that we might see on our whale watch. And it's going to be broken down into two groups, three, four, actually. But the two main ones are our dolphins, which are a group of toothed whales. Now, we like to call them a fun word. It's called odontocetes. Okay, what do you go to the orthodontist for? Yeah, typically teeth, braces, right? Um, so odontocetes are toothed whales. They have teeth just like you and I. So that's like our orca. They're actually the largest of the dolphin family. That's like our bottlenose dolphin, our Pacific white-sided, our rhizos dolphin, which is one of my favorites. And then we have our common dolphins. These, let's see, that one and that one, those are the ones that we typically see on our whale watches. We had a, a, a rhizos dolphin group show up for a couple of weeks recently. Pacific white-sided, we typically see in the winter. And then orcas are the oddball that can show up any day, but very rarely. So these are our toothed whales or odontocetes that we typically see here in California, at least in Southern California. So let's take a look at our, uh, our baleen whales. Now, these are some of our larger whale species. These are baleen whales. And actually, Sarah, if we can jump back to that humpback photo there real quick. Um, you'll see in the mouth of this animal, they don't have teeth, right? They have baleen. That's this hair-like structure that you see there. I like to think of it as a mustache in their mouth. And the way it works is, see these lines? Yeah. So those are their throat, uh, their pleated throat. So what that means is it opens up and expands. It takes in a whole gulp of water and food. And then as it closes, 
the big strong tongue and that little uh, that grooved throat just like in this photo, it expands, takes in a whole bunch of food and water, and then pushes and closed up. And these gray areas right here, that's the baleen. And it's pushing all the water through the baleen, but the food is stuck on the inside. So that's baleen. All right, so you'll hear me refer to them as our toothed whales or baleen whales, odontocetes, or these are called mysticetes. Okay, now our common mysticete species include blue whales. They include, that's a fin whale right there. I know they look similar except for color. This is the fluke or tail of a humpback. This is a humpback. This is a really exciting behavior to see on a whale watch. This is a breach behavior right here. And then this is our gray whale. So we're going to talk about, uh, let's see, humpbacks, grays, and probably blue whales today. And then some of our activities at the end for you to participate in will be um mostly focused on our blue whales. So let's go ahead and get started here. We'll actually start with our blue whales. So we're going to talk a little bit about our blue whale population. And Sarah, if you just want to rotate through, perfect, some blue whale photos. Um, this is a blue whale. Now, how do I know that, right? So here in Southern California, we actually have um, the largest single, um, what's the word I'm looking for? single subpopulation of blue whales in the world. We have over 2,000 blue whales that show up along our coastline um, during summer months for the most part, and that's because they're following food. They feed on itty bitty little krill. Let me see if I have an example of krill over here. Let's see. Here it is. It's always on the other side. All right. So this right here um, this is a hard plate that we have little krill in. We're going to go over to our document camera and take a closer look at it. Let me turn this on for you. But again, that really large animal on the screen right there, the blue whale, feed on one of the smallest animals. So again, this is the size of my hand. You get my hand there for comparison. We're going to zoom in on the krill. So they're kind of tiny little shrimp-like creatures. They're related. They're a group of arthropods. Now, blue whales can feed on thousands and thousands of pounds of krill every day. That's why they're found off of our coastline. In the summer months, we get a lot of really great um, algaes and zooplankton growing in our water, which brings in our larger krill, and then that brings in our largest blue whales. So let's go back to that blue whale photo here. We'll talk a little bit about that. Ooh, we have a video of blue whales. All right, I'll step the screen so you can see it. They are big, my friends. <laughs> I know the video doesn't do it justice, but blue whales, look, you can see it kind of show up underwater here. That's where they get their name. It's a little bit lighter, and there it goes. So blue whales are one of the largest, uh, or the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth. They can get up to 110 feet. Uh, typically off our coast, they're only around 90 or so, but they can reach 110 feet. And they're incredibly long, incredibly muscular, weighing over 350,000 pounds, okay? Um, for, for perspective, if you were to go whale watching in any boat, except for that boat, <laughs> That whale is larger than your whale watch boat, okay? Um, and so, see that lighter patch underwater? That's, again, where that name comes from, the blue whale. You'll notice when it actually surfaces, it's more of a mottled gray color. Um, so it can confuse people because there are also things such as gray whales uh, like that. There you go, beautiful blue whale right there, and it's just all the way. So, again, 90 feet typically in our waters, up to 110, incredibly large, and they're feeding on those itty bitty little creatures. Now, what did you notice before that? Actually, Sarah, if we could rewind just a little bit, a little more. Oh, no, this is perfect. Okay. What's something that as an animal in the ocean, uh, back so that we have the, there you go. There we go. As an animal in the ocean, right? You're cruising around, you're going for a swim, you're eating a bunch of food, and then it disappeared again. I want that ship in the shot. Yeah. Um, then, there we go, a ship shows up, right? Now, these ships don't actually move that fast, um, but they're much faster than they appear. 
So when you're looking at it, it kind of looks like it's just cruising. But that ship is actually moving a lot faster than it appears to the eye. Our whales are actually much slower than most of us give them credit. Whales only typically travel around 5 to 10 miles per hour, especially our large blue whales for how big they are. They're one of the kind of slower, just meandering species. Now, here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we do this really amazing thing called photo identification. And we also GPS mark our whale sightings. So what that means is we have naturalists on the boat. That's going to be someone like an educator who comes out and talks on the microphone, tells folks what they're looking at, what we might expect to see. But then we also have photo ID interns. Now, what do you notice that um, these two have right here? Yeah, real nice cameras, right? So they're really zoom lens cameras, and that's because they're trying to get an up-close photo of this whale. But we can't get so close that we actually um, change the whale's behavior. So the boat stays far away, but these lenses allow us to get up close and get a good visual on it. And that's because we're doing two things. One, we're taking this photo, okay, which we'll show you here in a moment. And another thing that they do, you can actually think, see it hanging on this person's neck right here. That's a little GPS tag. Uh, not like a tag that goes on the whale, but like um, that you can mark and it'll it'll mark where that um, where you were at that moment. So a lot of us have GPS tracking on our phone. So you could think of it like this. I parked my car here boop, and I'm going to put a little mark right there. And then when I go about my day, I remember where my car is. Right. Have you ever had to do that? I know I have. <laughs> so um, our GPS tags or little markers, it drops a pin of where we spotted that whale. So the Aquarium of the Pacific is um, partnered with Cascadia Research to collect these photo IDs, to collect this GPS information. And this information has actually been used to help protect our blue whales that are off of our coastline. Because remember that ship that we saw? Well, when you have whales and ships and they're interacting, it doesn't always go well. And so by looking at our photos and looking at our GPS data, we actually looked and noticed that our whales and ships are hanging out in the same area. And at first it's like, well, yeah, they're both in the ocean, right? But just like we have organized freeway systems on land, there's actually set shipping lanes in the ocean, something that most people don't realize. So the shipping lanes were running right through the majority of our sightings. And we used that data and we realized, well, if we move the shipping lane just like a mile this direction, which really didn't make much of a difference to the ship, it can make a huge difference to the ship and whale interactions. So that's just one example of some of our blue whale data. And we're actually going to pull up some photo IDs for you to take a look at. So I'm going to put two pictures on there. And I want you to spot similar, uh, similarities or differences. So I'll step off. Now, while you're making these observations, we've had some questions coming in. One of them is, how long have I been a naturalist for? And that's a really great question. So, oh gosh. I mean, I got my degree in marine biology because I love whales. So I have been learning about whales for a very long time. And you can be a naturalist without having um, any formal training in it. You can learn and study yourself. Um, then I was a, a formal naturalist. I think I started back in 2013. So we're going on about seven years now. Um, and I've worked and spotted whales all over the world, which is pretty exciting, mostly in the West Coast. Um, or Eastern Pacific, all the way from Washington down to Costa Rica. Um, but what do we notice here? Are they the same whale? I mean, they're drastically different colors, right? So as you scientists, I want you to think about, if you were to look at these two photos, would you say that it is the same whale or is not the same whale? I mean, just off like looking at it, gut reaction says definitely not. But if you look a little bit harder, you can see similarities that actually tell you that these two photos are, in fact, the same whale. One of them, the easiest way to tell, is this dorsal fin right here. Do you see the little notch? So whales that have scarring like that, A, means they have a great story, and B, it makes identification a lot easier. But what if it didn't have that notch? How else could we tell? Hmm. Let's look. Okay, see this dark patch on the top right here? Let's see if we can find that on the bottom photo. Yeah, it's actually the same right here. Watch my finger. It's going to follow this little J. And that's the same little J right here. 
okay um this one's kind of hard but you can see the pattern right here as well oh here's a good one see this little spot it almost looks like the united kingdom and there you go it's right there as well so again just looking at it like first glance like drastically different colors definitely not the same whale but when you start to look key details it's a little bit um more obvious right do we have another one that we can compare okay oh actually let's jump back to the blue whale um we're going to talk about this here in a moment so um if you want to jump to studio to go into the next blue whale photo all right so sarah's going to pull up another comparison for two blue whale photos and we're going to decide again are they the same whale or are they different using those same techniques that we just looked at are there any real obvious marks that are like yes same whale or are there any that are real obvious on one that don't show up in the in the other so she's going to pull that up and we'll take a look at what that might might be like there we go okay so are these the same whale It's different angles. Are there any markings that repeat themselves on the two photos? All right, I'm seeing a couple. So once again, same whale. Now, I know that even though it's drastically different angles, the dorsal fin um, is, so it's not as easy to use that, but we can look for different patterns. For example, right here, See those three little uh, adorable little spots? <laughs> well, they're right here as well. So they've got those same triple spots right there. Um, what about this lighter patch coming down from the dorsal fin? Remember, it's a different angle, but you can still see that. And there it is right there. Um, we've got this blob right here. We've got that blob right there. Now, once again, you might be looking at me like, you are crazy, right? But a lot of time and work and effort goes into this project. Our photo ID interns are on the boat. They're taking the pictures. Then they're going into um, online programs. Uh, they're, or they're going into programs on the computer, editing and analyzing all of the photos. And we actually have put a catalog together with Cascadia Research. Now, a catalog is almost like a whale um, yearbook, right? You're scrolling through and you're looking at all the pictures. And the way it works is you take these photos, you put them side by side, and we are able to identify individuals within the population. Now, if you recall, I said that there was about 2,000 blue whales found off of our coastline in the summer, and we've successfully identified over 200 individuals, which means we have documented about 10%, or just over 10% of our um, subpopulation here in California, which is pretty incredible. Now, this is probably one of the harder whales that we identify here off of our coast. We're going to go over to my document camera again. And Sarah pulled up that picture of the humpback whale earlier with the fluke right here. And we're going to go play another little matching game and see if we can compare these whales. Humpbacks are a little bit different. So humpback whales, we looked at the whole body earlier. But they also have wonderful flukes. Now, the shot that you see on the screen right now, that's a fluke. It's their tail, all right? And if we go to the document camera, we'll take a look here. I have some, oh my, where am I? <laughs> I have some photos of some humpback flukes, okay? So the lighting's going to be really hard to get these because they are laminated. So I'll do my best here. All right, so there's one. There's another. Are those the same whale? No, so that one was really easy to tell, right? What about those? Is that the same whale? Hmm, what do you think? So it's a little hard to tell, but the best way to look at this one, the dark, this one's dark, right? It's kind of hard to identify. But see this little circle right here? Yeah, you can actually see that circle right there as well. So that's a really good way. So, um, scar marks, right? How much white is on their fluke? So each humpback whale has an individual fluke print. I like to think of it like a fingerprint, right? That's how we can identify humans. So fingerprints, fluke prints, right? Let's see some other ones. Okay, so we've got you... Let's take a look at this one. This one doesn't have a whole lot of white on it. Right? In fact, it's just got these two little white patches right there. Hmm. 
All right, I'm going to put two photos up. And they're going to be similar. And I want you to decide which one it is. Is that the same whale? Or is that the same whale? Or is this a trick question? Okay, they all look real similar, <laughs> right? So what do you think? Okay, if you guessed that the two bottom ones are the same, you are right. Now, at first, you're like, that's all the same whale. But if you look at it, these white patches are a little bit brighter, and they're also a little bit higher up on the fluke. And you can also look at the shape of the actual um, fluke, right? So this one is a lot more bulbous on this side, and it's got this little notch here. Um, this one, obviously different angles, right? So it's all about the angle. It's all about the lighting. But humpbacks are much easier than our blue whales. Let's do one more. Ah, someone said it was a trick. You were right. It was because I put two matching ones up, right? So let's find one that... Um, one of Sarah's favorites here. Okay, so we already took a, pick, a look at this whale, right? We recognize the dot, the little circle. We'll check out if I can find it. Ooh, there we go. Okay, that one's very unique, right? That's drastically different. Uh, these two are drastically different than those other ones we just looked at. But is that the same whale? No, so even though they're very similar, they're still a lot easier to tell the part than our blue whales. This is Snowflake. She's got a little scar on her right there. Um, and then this obviously does not have that scar and it has the circle. This one does not. So again, photo identification, right? Um, let's go ahead and jump back to a whale photo, any whale photo. All right. So as she's going to pull up a whale photo, beautiful, a blue whale, I love it. Um, <laughs> we're going to chat a little bit more about um, why photo ID is important and why learning about whale populations can be important to know uh, their conservation status, right? So again, conservation is protecting these animals for future generations to come, uh, not just future generations of humans to go look at and learn about, but also future generations of whales. So if we, let's see, I'm going to use... Um, I'm going to use gray whales as an example. Okay, so gray whales are a whale that we have off of our coastline. And once upon a time, gray whale population was dropping drastically because of whaling. And so we saw these numbers plummet. And since protections have gone into place, um, one protection that protects all of our marine mammals is the Marine Mammal Protection uh, Act. It went in 1972. We also stopped whaling, right, which is definitely going to help our whales out. Um, and we've paid attention to coastal fisheries and stuff because we know the route of this whale. We've now seen this population rebound so much that it's estimated that there's over 26 thousand individuals right here off of California migrate um, all the way from Alaska up north doo -doo 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 -doo, down along our coastline down to Baja California and we have census counts as they go along the way and what's that told that has told us is that the protections we've put into place are helping our whales right so if before there was only a hundred individuals and then we put the Marine Mammal Protection Act into place. We paid attention to those shipping lanes, which didn't affect them as much, but it did the blue whales. Um, we stopped fishing them. Something that we do for these animals actually is we, we can adjust our fishing seasons for different um, species, right? For lobster fishing or crabbing or anything like that um, to make sure that we're not impacting their migration. And we've seen those numbers recover. Now that means we're doing something right, but we have to know that to know that we're making those differences. So a lot of whale conservation comes down to counting individuals, getting an idea of what their population is like, and getting an idea of what their migration route is. Understanding how many whales there are and where they're going, right? Because a lot of impacts on whales are human impacts in using our oceans. How we're fishing, how we're traveling on the surface, um, what kind of, a lot of it, don't get me wrong, a lot of it is like pollution in the water, 
but mostly it's human animal interactions in some way. So I hope you all learned a lot about our whales and conservation and how us here at the Aquarium of the Pacific participate with Cascadia Research. We are partnered with Harbor Breeze Cruises to go out on our oceans, GPS our sightings, take those ID photos, and get as much information about these animals as possible. If you have any questions about uh, whale conservation and what else you can do, there are so many populations of whales all around the world that need help. So I actually encourage you to do a little bit more research on different populations. Some of my favorites that you might want to look up are the vaquita. They're actually the most endangered marine mammal in the world, and they are not quite local, but they're very close to us. They're found in the northern part of the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California um, down in Baja. So this is the vaquita. It's estimated that there's less than 10 left in the world. Another, uh, another species you could learn a little bit more about is the North Atlantic right whale. They also deal with the ship interactions and uh, adjusting shipping lanes and making sure that there's less interaction on the water. Um, another population is the southern resident killer whales up in Washington state. So those are just my three highlights that I'd love to learn a little bit more about if you're interested in marine mammal or whale conservation. But like I said, scientists, we can also go on and learn a little bit more um, through our online activities that we have available for you. If you're at our website, it'll be under the same link as this class was. And there's two activities to participate in. One of them is learning uh, a little bit more about what it means to be a naturalist. So it's called Career Connections. You'll learn a little bit about what my role might be here at the aquarium. Um, it is not with me, but similar role. And then you'll learn a little bit more about maybe how you could get to be a naturalist. And then the other part is learning a little bit more about blue whales. Again, it's the largest animal that ever lived on Earth. So go ahead and explore about our whales, see what else you can discover. We just kind of touched the tip of the iceberg in this class here. So again, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you back here tomorrow. What did I say the topic was? Sharks tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow's topic is shark conservation. And you'll see that a lot of it is actually kind of similar. It's learning where sharks are, how many sharks there are, and learning a little bit more about their population dynamics. So we'll see you back tomorrow at one o'clock. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Bye, everyone.